Hello everyone, today is Halloween 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, we want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If you're watching a recording of this later today or tomorrow, whenever, and you could not find the live show, please let me know. We seem to still be having a few problems getting to the live show. There's a slam screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as often sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what do we talk about? Well, obviously, we need to talk about the market, and even though we're at or near new highs, I'm just not buying it just yet, but as a trend follower, I might have to make sure I'm not confusing the issue with facts, but right now I'm still seeing a few questionable things and we'll flesh that out. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them on the slides and when we get to the charts, you can ask about anything, including your favorite stock picks. And when we do get to the charts, we'll hold off on the stock picks, I should say, until we get to the actual charts, just to make sure I see them all. And also for your benefit, ask about one at a time and then hit return. That way I know which ones I've covered and which ones that I have and I don't overlook, overlook anything. Today we're gonna to talk about five simple steps to your trading success. What I've been doing lately is because I've got so much content and over the past couple of years, that content without being vain, but has gotten better and better. So I'm only going back a couple of years and looking at what I've done. And then eventually I'll probably go back and look at everything, but I've got so many ideas for new content. There's so much old content I think needs to be fleshed out. So anyway, long story endless. I went back in and I found this five simple steps to your trading success. And I dusted it off and cleaned it up a little bit. And I did this a little bit over a year ago. So let's talk about those five simple steps to your trading success. Well, there's a few assumptions before we get started. And the first one is you have studied a methodology thoroughly and know the good, the bad, and the ugly. In other words, you are consciously competent. That's one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately. I've done a few little kind of mini presentations on trading psychology. And the one thing I was thinking about before doing these presentations was before you even begin to try to wrap your head around trading psychology, which can take a while and it's an ongoing journey, but before you can even begin, you have to make sure that you're consciously competent to begin with. Now that reminds me of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I didn't know actually existed until one day I went out and tried to draw a little graph and if you go back about a year and a half ago, you'll see it on my YouTube channel and probably buried somewhere on my website. But I went to draw this little curve, which I'll, I'll draw for you in just one second. And then I realized that somebody had done this a long time ago. And basically, when you just start out, you have all this confidence. And then that begins to wane really quickly. And then over time, you get experience and you work your way back up to confidence and become consciously competent as an expert. You sort of, you thought, you think you know, and you, then you know that you don't know, and then you know. So this is a little bit more with what that curve looks like. And again, it's not nearly as clean as the Dunning-Kruger curve shows, at least not at least not as it applies to trading so this red line here is what you think you know and you become pretty delusional pretty fast because often you have some initial success and you're like man this trading thing is super duper easy especially if you start in a bull market and buying a bunch of stocks or you catch me doing a hot streak and everything I touch turns to gold. And you think that, wow, I've got it. And I'm going to just go off and do this on my own. I don't even need this Dave guy. Not that you need me, but 
it can help to have someone else looking at things, especially if they're looking at things similar to you, just like we help each other out in the Facebook group. And without being egotistical, I wish I had somebody like me I could consult with before making trades and to help me find setups and so on and so forth. So I try to scratch my own itch. And when I put out content and when I especially when I put out my trading starts every night, I do that for me, and then I do it as if someone were doing it for me, and hopefully that makes sense. But anyway, you can get really delusional really fast, especially if you hit it just right. Now, i use the example of getting long a bunch of stocks in a raging bull market, but I've seen just the opposite happen too. I've seen people come in, especially when the market's just beginning to roll over, and I'm recommending a plethora of shorts, and they start shorting with both fists, and they never have a losing trade for a while. And if they do, they have so many winning trades, they just think they've absolutely figured it out. Unfortunately, they get kind of caught up in the short side, and when the trend finally turns, they have a hard time buying stocks. So you have to live through a variety of conditions. And once you kind of get your ass handed to you a little bit, and then all of a sudden you end up with, some success and then you end up with some some losses and then you end up with some set su success easy for me to say almost my presentation almost went less than or more than pg-13 huh? and one of the problems that you can end up here is system surfing or grail hunting and the problem with that is you hit it right just right every now and then but unfortunately that doesn't last and you end up perpetually out of phase and then you end up in despair and if you're not careful you can kind of get sucked into these scumbags out there with the lure of rented jets on tarmacs it's like they never go anywhere <laughs> you never see them like hey we're getting on hey we're getting off <laughs> they just anyway before I get into a lot of trouble, I'm gonna stop that. Now, what you actually know looks a lot like this bottom curve. And what's interesting is, and in, in where my whole presentation, my original presentation on this Dunning-Kruger effect, before I even had any idea what the Dunning-Kruger effect was, was that you, you don't know, but you think you know. And then you kind of the, the, you kind of flip the script till you get to a point where you know, but you don't think you know. You just kind of get beaten up so much. And what you actually know begins to grow at a gradual level because you know how many things that you, you didn't know in the past, what didn't work and what actually works. And then eventually, these two curves will come together in the end. So we all tend to have to go through this trader's journey, through these cycles, and I try to help people avoid going through such a steep learning curve and taking so much time, but it seems like we almost have to go through all these phases before we finally begin to get it. So there's also some assumptions. Number one, you are adequately capitalized and not trading with the rent and grocery money. Now that's that's a pretty big one. Just make sure you have some money to put aside for trading and just trading. Now I often say, if you don't have any money to trade, then spend what little you have on getting educated. Now yeah, it's self-fulfilling, but I promise you, for a small amount of money, you can learn a lot, and I will save you a lot of money and a lot of heartache. I'm, heartache. I'm not sure why everybody goes in and just keeps losing money, losing money, losing money, losing money. And I actually have a slide on that, thinking that they're learning how to trade. As Derek Bott once said, if you think education is experience, try ignorance. His last name might, his last name might be Bach, B O K. I might have written that down wrong. But anyway, Derek, sorry if I messed up your name. 
So that's the point I was trying to make about lose, 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 rinse and repeat and trying to learn how to trade. Tuition is ridiculously expensive in real dollars when it comes to the market. It reminds me of Einstein's definition of insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. And believe me, sometimes when I'm in a drawdown or every time I'm in a drawdown, I begin to think about Mr. Einstein and am I insane in what I'm doing? And that's where you get those little blips towards the right side of that Dunning-Kruger effect curve or whatever you want to call the trader's curve that I just kind of pan drew there. Now, the other thing you have to be really careful with as you're getting into trading before we get to the steps to success is I think L.R. Thomas said it the best, although I do think I've heard this from other traders, but I'll definitely give her credit. Don't expect trading to fill a hole missing in your life. And that's vitally important. You have to somehow separate trading. It has to be it a little bit more or as much as possible, I should say, of a bubble and you have to try, and I, I shouldn't say the word try, but it's difficult to separate that from your life. Your life will spill over into your trading. Your trading will spill over into your life. And that hole is going to move. I know it sounds kind of bizarre, but there's always something to worry about. There's always going to be something that's going to be mucking with your trading. I was thinking this morning how simple trading really is and that's probably why years ago i trademarked trading simplified but then it's really difficult in actually doing what you're supposed to do and one of those problems has nothing to do with trading it's so many of these things that are happening in your life now this original presentation i did a little over a year ago and I just lost my second parent, my mother, after losing my father six months and a day prior to that. And then there were lots of little other things in my life. We had just got the plans back. If you go and watch a YouTube from a year or so ago when I did this presentation originally, we just got the plans back from the house planner. And they had informed us that the historical society did not want us to have the garage where it was which meant that we were going to have to move it back 25 feet, which meant some planning fees, which wouldn't cost a whole lot. But then how much money, I began to wonder what it cost us to move that garage back. And could I make that up in trading? And the same, at the same time, my wife had contracted cholera, which I don't, I forget the math, but I think it's like one in 50 million chance of contracting cholera in the United States. The CDC actually called our house and had about a 45 minute interview with her. It was kind of a fascinating process, bad for her. We ended up in the hospital a couple of nights or uh, two separate trips, I should say, to the emergency room, but uh, kind of fascinating in hindsight how it all unfolded. And the other thing about trading that I've been thinking about a lot lately is that you get iced quite a bit the old saying icing of the kicker somebody was asking me what, what do they mean ice the kicker it's like well i'm not a huge football fan except for the saints which i'll occasionally go to a home game who that but i do know a little bit about it and icing of the kicker is right before the kicker goes to kick the the field goal that'll win the game if he makes it they call a timeout to give him some time to contemplate his navel to try to mess with his head. Well, in trading, a lot of times you're going to get iced. My wife owns her own company, and usually her first appointment is at nine o'clock. And especially now that we have this new house where she's a little bit closer and she likes to get there a little bit earlier, but she doesn't have to leave it an hour before, which is fine with me an hour before because I've got 30 minutes before the open. I can say goodbye to her or figure out what needs to be done or whatever in life well now 8 29 59 usually she walks over to my office 
to tell me goodbye, which is a nice thing. But a lot of times there's business to be dealt with and all these other things, especially now. It, it's always especially now, but especially now with the new house, we're still working through issues. OK, this guy's coming at this time. This appliance guy's coming at this time. And you need to be here for this. And, you know, all these things to deal with. And then my little screen over here goes ding, 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 ding. The market's open. So these outside influences can really muck up your trading. And there's always going to be something to worry about. So we haven't even gotten into the five steps, but this is kind of a prequel to all that. Now, Confucius say elevators smell much differently to short people. And he also said things like a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So again, continuing in the prequel to the five steps for the aspiring trader, what is the first step before the first step? Well, obviously you would wanna do paper trading and all these other things too, but when you're ready to actually place a trade, then on that first trade and only that trade, just follow your plan. Now, if you could do that, you have proven that you can do it. Or as people who know me and you, you hear a little Cajun might slip out every now and then, I'm a coon ass. <laughs> You okay, do it. Kind of like the townie from, from Waterboy. But seriously, if you could follow that plan, even if it's a crappy plan, okay? A crappy plan followed well is better than a good plan not followed at all. Even if you lose money and you could follow some sort of system, and I hate to use the word mechanically or mechanical system, but maybe when you're starting out, if you did something very mechanical, it probably wouldn't be that bad of an idea. I think longer term, very hard to make money with a pure mechanical system. But if that purely mechanical system can help you to get some reps in and can help you to follow the process, then by all means, do it. Now, getting to the first step, you want to pick the best and leave the rest. And I know that's really cliche. And even after doing this for a long, long time, and I swore I would do a presentation without saying the intuition versus the intuition thing from Ed Sakota and Market Wizards, but it's true. It's like, especially if there's a hole in your life, especially if there's expenses, there's a an S ton of expenses that I never so ahead of time with a new house. And this is my first new house at 50 something years old, finally getting around to buying my first new house. And so a lot of times I'm under pressure to generate that money. And I hate to use the word income, but that's what it is. Try to generate some income, which is impossible to do from the market in, in actual trading because you never know when that money is going to come in. You can't force it to happen. The market does not adhere to your time frame. Trends, trends don't happen every day. So very hard, and I have to constantly remind myself to pick the best and leave the rest. As I learned early on in my computer science days, garbage in equals garbage out. And you'd be surprised that I always preach that money management will cure a multitude of the sins. But before we even get to the money management, if you're picking the best and leaving the rest, you're going to have less losses to begin with, and life's going to be a lot easier. So let's do a crash course in stock selection. First thing, and I see this all the time, people send me charts that look like an electrocardiogram. This is an actual chart from a few years back. And as you can see, it's all over the place. And as I talked about in yesterday's show for stock charts, and as I've talked about in Trading Full Circle and in many other presentations, I know I'm 
inclined to beat the dead horse, but I'm gonna keep beating the dead horse until you people get it and until I make <laughs> fewer mistakes by not by uh, not practicing what I preach, right? Because I'm still human and still have a lot of these temptations to try to force to make that money, force to make things happen. So, but anyway, as I said in yesterday's stock chart show and prior to that, the more successful you are, the more inclined you will be potentially to pick less than ideal stocks because one, you'll be looking for action and two, in your day-to-day -day life, as Dr. J, the psychiatrist, explained to me, you can't sit around and wait for the perfect client. You have to take whatever train wreck comes along. So the training in the real world is a little bit different than the trading, training in the trading world. That's easy for me to say. So it is hard sometimes to sit around and wait for that perfect setup because you've been trained not to. Now, what does that perfect setup look like or what does a good setup look like? Well, it took me 14 hours to go through everything I know in my stock selection course. So obviously in just a few minutes, it's gonna be hard for me to give you all the things you need to know, but if you just followed a few of these things, you would be well on your way. And I always joke about the electrocardiogram, but if you come to enough of these weekend chart shows, especially if you look at the older ones when I was getting the announcements out where we had a lot more people in here and a lot more newer people, you'd be surprised at how many people ask about stocks that have just bounced around forever. So you wanna look for characteristics that or conducive for trading, such as persistency, meaning that the stock or other market tends to go up day after day after day after day, or for downtrends, tends to go down day after day after day after day. A little bit harder to find that persistency on the downside due to the sharp retrace rallies, but it can be found and it should you should look for it as much as possible. I've done a few articles on the power of persistency and it absolutely amazes me how important persistency could be and how useful it could be. And the best way to do the gauge persistency is just draw a line through as many bars as possible. And mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression. And years ago, I used to put about 20 or 30 linear regression bars on a chart just for S and Gs. It just to kind of alert me as to what the market may be doing shorter term, longer term, and much, much longer term. And it's a pretty cool exercise, but the linear regression trend line is equivalent to just drawing a line through your charts, or draw a line through your charts, the same thing as linear regression. And if you can draw a line and intersect most of the bars, and especially on the upside, if the bars that you can't inter intersect or above the line you drew, then you know you have a good persistent trend. Now, I get asked about a lot of stocks that are decelerating. If you look at the longer term trend, they're still going up and they still look pretty good. But when you look at the more recent trading, you can see that they're beginning to lose steam. So you want to have charts look like the one on the right where the market is beginning to accelerate. The one on the left here, as I often point out, a lot of times, let's say you have a couple of wide range bars. There's different ways this can shake out. But one way would be you have a couple of wide range bars and then that's pretty much it. And you'll see me often talk about that over and over again. So this action over here might be a couple of wide range bars and then it might continue higher, but at a much more gradual pace. The other way this could happen would be, this could be like over a long period of time where it keeps going up, going up, going up, and then it starts kind of rolling over. And even though if you look at it on a net net basis, it still looks pretty darn good as far as the big blue arrow is concerned. Not sure why my arrow is black today, but that should be blue. But you really have to look to see if, is it, if it's doing this or if it's doing this. In other words, is it accelerating 
or decelerating. And I know, again, it's stock selection 101, but you'd be surprised at how many people look to trade mediocre markets. Now, if you take a look at the net-net price change, one of the most powerful things out there, and obviously the most simplest thing, if you didn't know anything about markets, you could certainly ask yourself, is it higher or lower or unchanged or about the same from where it was? Dave, how long do you look back? Well, look back a day, look back two days, look back five days, look back 10 days, look back 10 weeks, look back 10 months, and then look back a few years. So you get that short, intermediate term and longer term perspective. Now, ideally you wanna see a market that makes a saw tooth type of pattern. Higher. You wanna see it make higher highs and higher lows, and then you want the pullbacks to be also higher highs and higher lows, obviously. So for instance, you wanna have like a thrust, a pullback, a thrust, a pullback, a thrust, a pullback, rinse and repeat. So the market has shown the propensity, this is for established trends, but has shown the propensity to trend, have orderly corrections. And then I hate to use the word hold, but hopefully when you get on the next correction, then it continues to rinse and repeat. So that's a good thing. Now, this chart to the right or this figure to the right would be a bad thing because people often say, hey, Dave, that's a pullback. I like it. What do you think? And I'm like, well, notice that you had your pullback here, the market took off, and then it pulls back into the prior pullback. Okay. So this is a market that is if you look at it on a net net basis, has obviously lost some steam, okay? And it also could be coming back down here, could also be in the early phases of making the top. You just wanna see that higher pullback along the way, higher highs, higher lows, higher corrections along the way, as opposed, of, as opposed to a correction coming back into a correction. Now, with the base breakouts, I'm not a breakout trader except in IPOs. I do have some positions that you could consider being breakout or I consider being breakout in nature. But one pattern I do like in general is you have a nice, nice base. The bigger the base, the bigger the launch in the space. I thought I made that up, but I later found out that I think it was Ralph, Ralph A. What's his name? Ralph? I forget his last name, but anyway, Ralph, he said it. <laughs> anyway, I like to trade the first pullback after a base breakout. I don't try to buy it here because often the market will break out of that range and come right back in, breakouts tend to fail. I'd much rather buy that first pullback after it breaks out of the range. But if you have a breakout and it comes all the way back in to the range, then you're back in the range, okay? What's your net net longer term? What's your net net shorter term? Down, net net longer term is sideways, okay? Now again, your eyes may be glazing over, but you'd be surprised at how many people deal with mediocrity. Gaps against the trend or a bad thing, okay? You wanna have gaps with the trend. Sands, commodities, and foreign stocks, because both of those can gap overnight, and it's not what I would consider a quote unquote, true gap. Okay, so a gap against the trend would be like if, that can happen in a multitude of ways, but if you're looking at a setup, the first thing you always need to do is ask yourself, is there a gap against the trend? This is the trend. Now, yeah, you want the market to correct, but you don't want to see gaps in that correction because that means that that market might be in trouble. You also wanna see some gaps ideally with the trend. Now, not huge gaps because you could have too much of a good thing, but ideally some gaps in the direction of the trend, if there are to be gaps, okay? And not against the trend, unless of course you're trading commodity related stock or a foreign stock where it that could be more normal. 
Now, again, as much as I preach all these things, I still get to ask a lot of questions about them. I'm not sure if it's just new people coming in or what. And if it's new people, fantastic. That's exciting. But one thing you want to look for is overhead supply. And if you're going to short a market, let's say it's got a big base back here somewhere, okay, then the chances that this market might find support down at that base are pretty good. And then you only have this much potential. Now, on the upside, it's called overhead supply. It's kind of like the joke about the whorehouse over the <laughs> wood business will make it. You got like six businesses, and one of them's a hardware store and it's got a brothel above it and the, it, it fails because there's too much you know overhead anyway that probably makes no sense but you might be able to google that but if you come into a market and there's a plethora of overhead okay and let's say you're looking to get long that market and this often happens with the transitional setup and that's why i kind of drew this as a bit of like a cup and handle or first thrust and probably like a bow tie and reason I drew it like this, again, because with these transitional patterns, a lot of times the market will go down, base, go down, and base. And then when you finally do get your turnaround, you have a lot of overhead supply. But the thing is, you could your gains could be capped because it, more than likely it will hit some resistance here. Now, if, that, if this number two is 100% away, then that's a good problem to have if it made it all the way back up to resistance. So you have, you have to ask yourself, how far back in time is it? And just remember that markets have really long memories. And you also have to ask yourself how far away from the market it is. And again, if it's 100% away, that's probably okay. So avoid positions that have overhead supply. Number two, I will plan my trade ahead of time. Now, in planning a trade, obviously you need an entry, a stop, initial profit target, and a trailing stop. Now, how many times have I beaten the dead horse on planning your trade ahead of time? But even with all this preaching, people still are like, hey, Dave, where should my stop be on this? Where should I, what should I do with this? What should I do with that? It's like, well, Let's take a look at your original plan. Oh, I don't, I don't have one of those. If you had an original plan, we could look at it and say, well, wait a minute, this stock is very volatile and your stops are very tight and your initial profit target and all that are very tight. We probably need to loosen that up. Or conversely, it's like, well, you got to stop way down here and this thing really in that volatile, we could probably tighten those stops up a little bit. Now, the one thing that I added to this, and I've been really thinking about a lot lately, is the pre-mortem. As you know, I beat the dead horse in the post-mortem, which I will <laughs> fairly soon in this presentation. But the pre-mortem is something that I've been thinking a lot about lately and is really, really important. So the pre-mortem, you have to ask yourself, have you fully accepted the risk of the trade? And Douglas has done a lot of work here. I've got my trading library put together and it's pretty cool. And I ran out of bookshelf space really quick. So I had to put some mediocre books back in the attic, but there's a few ones that I'm keeping out and I'm gonna refer back to off. And one of them is gonna be everything by Mark Douglas the late, great Mark Douglas. And unfortunately, I was supposed to be with a, on a project with him years ago and it didn't, it didn't shake out, but he seemed like a really nice guy. And I'm a huge fan. So God bless you, my, bro my brother from another mother. But one of the things that he talks about, he talks a lot about fear in the markets and what you fear is not the markets, but whether or not you're gonna be able to do the right thing. and in the fact that you have not fully accepted the risk. So you have to accept the risk going in to a trade. 
And that doesn't have to be that complicated. If you were to get stopped out on this potential trade, could you shrug your shoulders and say, meh? And that's what I ask myself all the time. Not that you want to lose the money, okay? You definitely want to make sure you pick the best and leave with the rest. But if you look at a stock and it's like, well, so what if I lose that money? I really like the setup. I think it's worth the risk. Then by all means, take it. But if you feel like, man, I don't, geez, I don't want to lose that money. And the reason I'm feeling that way is like, because the setup isn't mediocre. If that stops you from taking that trade, then fantastic. That's great. So again, you have to ask yourself, is it really worth it? Now, if so, you can kind of make darn sure, even though I'm saying the same thing here, but what I'm trying to say is you can make darn sure by taking your loss up front. And it's a little hard to wrap your head around that. Basically said, okay, if I get stopped out, how would I feel? Well, when I trade a long options position, I kind of see it as taking my loss up front. How much money do I want to put up? How much money is, am I willing to lose? The options game, as I preach, is very, very, very hard. You've got to get your timing right. You've got to get your movement right. And in some cases, you have to get your volatility right. And that can be really hard. So if I take, an, take on an options position, I kind of say, well, I'm taking my loss up front. And then I'll work to improve upon that situation, usually without digressing too far, I don't imagine that, but usually what I like to do is I like to flip out half of those options at a double, and then that way I'm free rolling and can figure out how to manage the rest of the position from there. But usually whenever I put an options position in my trading journal, I write down that amount of money as my loss for the day. And then when I scratch out of the options, or I should say when I am able to sell half for my for a scratch, then, I, then I'm breaking even on that position is the way I kind of view it. And then anything from that point forward is the profit. Now, this is kind of the same thing along the lines of just follow your plan. My presentation could have been really short today. It's like study the markets, paper trade, plan your trade, entry, stop loss, initial profit target, trade stop, my work is done. You know, I drop the mic and then move off. I'm not going to beat my mic because I don't want to buy another mic. <laughs> but you'd be surprised at how many people don't wait for an entry. I know I've told this story ad nauseum and beat the dead horse here, but You'd be surprised at how many emails I get from people. Hey, Dave, what do I do with this stock? What's it's like? Wow, well, I never recommended that stock. Why? Why are you blaming me? It's like, yes, you did. You know, I go back and look at the charts. Like, yeah, that was six months ago, and it never triggered. But a lot of people are anxious to get in, and they don't wait for that entry. And it's one thing that I've had a hard time quantifying, but especially since your drawdowns grow geometrically, if you think about it, if you lose 2% on a trade, then you're going to have to make back more than 2.2% to get that money back. And then the other thing is, it's a slippery slope. If you're not following the plan to begin with by waiting for that entry, then what have you done? Well, you've busted the plan, which means that psychologically, you're not disciplined so are you really going to stop yourself out at a 2% loss on that trade? So from a psychological perspective and a monetary perspective, very hard to quantify missing, losing trades, okay? But missing, losing trades is huge. It's one of the biggest things out there. And if you think about it, if you could avoid all losing trades, then you would, you would own the world pretty quickly. That would be a holy grail, right? But you could avoid a lot of losing trades, and this amazes me, how many you will avoid by waiting for an entry. And in more recent years, as I discussed in the Q&A a couple of weeks back, when I was talking about what's changed with the methodology, one of the things that's changed is not the methodology in and of itself. I'm still trading TKLs, I'm still trading bow ties, 
it amazes me that all these patterns still work, okay? But what's changed is little tweaks like my entries are a little bit wider, so now a stock really has to rally to get me into the position. And that has kept me out of a lot of trouble. So speaking of entries, when we're trading pullbacks, we're not trying to metaphorically catch that falling knife like a reversion to the mean trader. What we're doing is we're looking to buy on straight, even though we have to pay up a little bit to get in. Number four, I will see the position to its fruition and not micromanage. Micromanaging, another one of those huge sins, so to speak, that I see all the time. And I'm often tempted to micromanage versus follow the plan. And that's another one of those things. If you can agree to a plan to begin with, then your life gets a lot easier and you're not sitting there doing that mental masturbation, like should I get out, should I stay in? It's kind of like the Jackie Mason thing going on in your head. And when you start doing that, you're creating a lot of stress and a lot of emotions and a lot of the negative downward spiral that we often talk about. And I think somewhere in here, we have a, a slide from Dr. Janice Thorne where she talks about that your dopamine and your all these things that are happening in your head are two and a half times the emotional impact as a positive observation. And I think it was in yesterday's stock chart show, I drew a little emotional graph and all I did was and there's probably ways you could flesh this out a little further, but I think the point was made that on a plus day, I'm going to give a plus one for my emotional well-being. And on a minus day, I'm going to give a minus two. And even markets that are trending higher have a lot of down days in between. And you multiply that times two. And the more observations you make, you're going to have a pretty serious downward spiral. So the point is, if you're watching a chart intraday on something that's a big long-term position trade, you're going to feel really bad. You're going to put yourself into a state of regret pretty quick, and you're going to want to micromanage versus following the plan. And again, micromanagement, probably the biggest sin out there. And this is just one example. This, was a, this one's a little dated, but I'll show you one that I'm pretty sure will be relevant. So we had a buy right here, stop right there. What did the stock do? Had a couple of days in the plus column, or actually just maybe one, the day we got in and the next day, and then it came back in. Well, I received an email. The day the stock took off, I sold ARWR yesterday. Why did he sell? Well, it was going down. But Dave, aren't we trend followers? Yes, but we also are Follow the plan followers. I might want to write that down. I like that. So that's one way to put yourself in a state of regret. Now, here's the thing. Nine out of 10 times micromanagement works. Unfortunately, that 10th time, it doesn't. And that 10th time might have been the trade that would have paid for a lot of losing trades. And that 10th trade or 10th time might have been the trade that pays for your year. So last week, as you know, I did some dead money reports in my week in charts. And it, it seems like lately we've had a plethora of stocks that really tested our patience. And this is just one of many, but this is PAGS. Nice little first thrust lower. There's a parameters down there. And AFU continues to test our patience for what it's worth. And then we had an entry here, a stop way up here, because that's what it called for. Kind of a pioneer type of setup. Initial profit target down here. And what did it do? Well, we had only one day, maybe two or three, but out of those 
three weeks of trading, for the most part, we were underwater, very hard to sit in a trade when it appears to be dead money. Like I preached last week, and as I preach quite often, <laughs> beat the dead horse, I beat the dead horse, I beat the dead horse. A lot of people give up, and they're not willing to see the position to its fruition, and they exit the market early because they feel like it has no chance of ever working. Well, if you knew it had no chance of ever working, then by all means, get out, but you don't know. And then, of course, right about the time, three weeks into that trade, you feel like, uh, hey, you know, this is pretty stupid for me to hold on to this losing trade. I'm a trend guy, right? Right about that time, the market finally begins to take off. I think of the market adage, which I first heard from Linda Rasky, and she told me it's probably some floor adage that she picked up on the floor years ago. She's very modest, but anyway, the market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most amount of people, and the corollary, the market will do what it has to do to cause the most pain to the most amount of people. This morning, for instance, I had a short on, and it came really close to my stop yesterday, and I found myself thinking, Dave, why not just get out? Because you're only a few cents away from your stop. What are you gonna do if you come in tomorrow and a gap's higher? And I'm like, well, what would Dave Landry do? I know you're probably thinking the voices in this guy's head would drive me nuts if I was working next to him. But anyway, I'm thinking, well, what would Dave Landry do? It's like, well, Dave Landry needs to follow the plan. So I did not exit that trade. And this morning, guess what happened? It gapped two points against me. And I was like, I gotta get out, gotta get out, gotta get out. And it's like, well, hang on. Let me just look at this. Let me not lose my cool. If it keeps going against me, then obviously I need to have an uncle point, need to get out, applying a little discretion thing. But I began to think, is this market faking me out to cause me the most amount of pain and getting ready to do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner, getting ready to sell off hard, but first it's gonna shake the trees a little bit. Now I'm not saying throw caution to the wind, but realize those psychological feelings you're feeling are being felt like other people and or people getting fooled into this trade, okay? But again, you have to have an uncle point. I'm kind of backing into using discretion, but the point I'm trying to make, and believe it or not, I have one, is that the market is gonna tempt you to do a lot of things and it's gonna be very difficult and still is very difficult, I should say, but it's very difficult, especially starting out, not to do those things and often those things will pay off until they don't let me just see where the stock is oh it's back up a little bit oh maybe you need to get out <laughs> so follow the process which means pick the best and leave the rest i know it's cliche but how often are you really doing that and it's a constant battle with me and I see a lot of you guys doing the same thing in the Facebook group and all. It's like, we're all craving action because we all need money. Everybody needs money. <laughs> what was it, mediocrity? Oh, wow, how, how crazy is that? You, need, you like money too, you know, yeah. So pick the best, leave the rest. And of course, plan the trade. Where will you be wrong? Accept it. Where were you taking partial profits? Now, I used to have a little bit of a problem with this. I found myself frustrated. The problem with taking partial profits is it does make you feel good when you do it. But psychologically, if that market continues to take off without you, you're bummed out because now you only have a half position. And psychologically, if that market comes all the way back in, you kind of felt like, well, why didn't I take 100% of the profit? Well, you just have to be willing to live with the situation. So let's say I exit half a position and it comes right back in. I have to live with that, okay? Even though I would have made twice as much if I'd exited 
percentage to position. I know this is how the game works. If I'm ever to capture a nice trend and be able to free roll or play with the market's money, however you want to look at it, I'm going to have to take those partial profits and get that stop up to break even and then let the chips fall where they may. And if that's all I get is a partial profit, then so what? Better than a poke in the eye. If my math is correct, I should make 1% on that trade. Well, if you make 1% overall on a trade, that's not too bad. You do that often enough, you're not going to get rich, but that'll keep the lights on until you do occasionally catch that big trend. And then again, you have to also accept it if it's much more. So, and, and it's human nature. I'm looking at this short right now down, I have my trading desk on the other side of the room to make me get up and walk away and not stand in front of it all day and, and trade. I also have it as a fixed standing desk or just a fixed, fixed high desk where I have to stand. So I'm not gonna stand there all day like an idiot watching a screen. But anyway, it's down quite nicely today. And I did find myself thinking, Man, I had on twice as many shares as what I have on now. And I'm looking at how much I made today so far, which is always a bad thing, obviously. But I also found myself saying, wow, I could have twice as much. It's like, well, no, Dave, just follow the plan, even though it's going to be hard to do sometime, even though I'm going to have these frustrations or temptations, however you want to look at it, like, well, I could have made a lot more on that. You'll always have that. That's the thing about trading is you never really get it right. You have to accept the imperfection of it all, especially as a trend follower. Going in, you're going to be wrong a lot of the time, and that's why we have a little swing trade mentality. We look for something that has longer-term potential, but we also look, look for something that has that immediate swing trade payoff. And then we take partial profits in case we're right small, and then we trail a stop in case we're right big. That's the only way to kind of have your cake and eat it too that I figured out. If you figure out something better, please let me know. Write me a letter. But the other thing is that if you tried to be a pure trend follower, you would be wrong. Believe it or not, this is one statistic that does hold true. A few statistics in the markets hold true, but this one does. You're going to be wrong about 72% of the time. Very hard to be wrong roughly three quarters of the time. It's It just takes an incredible amount of mental fortitude. I'm not sure how people can trade like that. And that's why I try to take that hybrid approach. Now, on the flip side, short-term trades would be more accurate. But if you're only taking short-term profits, you're never going to pay for that occasional big spanking. You need an occasional big winner. So also ask yourself, after you take those partial profits, and I guess since we're planning the trade, right, you would have to kind of do all this mentally as your pre-mortem. So how are you going to trail that stop? And you want to turn off your screens and find something to do that's, as one of my clients said, that's far more interesting. I try to get out of here mid-mornings if I don't have a webinar like today or meetings like this afternoon. But I try to get out of here by mid-morning and go to the gym. Well, for me to go to the gym, I gotta get, I have to have all my orders placed. Like I said in the last q and I'm a big fan of food, hence the name Big Dave. That's why I have to go to the gym. <laughs> but I get really, really hungry around 30 minutes after the open. And my rule is, my commitment device, so to speak, is that I am not going to go to breakfast or go make breakfast or whatever until I have all my orders placed. So it forces me to place all my orders and it forces me to be able to walk away from the screen and not micromanage. And, you know, there's little things you could do. Like I just said, I wasn't sure where the position was. I had to go over there and shake the mouse. And I thought about changing this, but I realized that it could be dangerous. I just have a screensaver set to, oh, I don't know, five minutes or less. Whatever it defaulted to when I set the computer up, which I think is five minutes. So 
if I'm working on something else for five minutes, that screen goes dark and I find myself less tempted to watch it. So like, you know, right now is a bad example because I'm doing a presentation, which which just keep me pretty busy. But while working on this presentation, I find myself looking over my left, left shoulder a lot, squinting my eyes, trying to read the screen. And if I look over my left, left shoulder and it's a black screen, I'm less likely to get up from my chair and walk over there and shake the mouse to see what's going on. Now, here's a biggie. And you know what? I'm guilty of this. This morning I wrote in my to-do list, Dave, you really need to work on your postmortems. And if you can learn how to do an honest postmortem after every trade, focusing on the process and not the outcome and longer term, if you could figure out how to, if here's the thing, if you could figure out how to separate luck from skill, write me a letter. But I think doing the postmortems are going to get you really, really close to that. Annie Duke's book, Thinking in Bets, which I hope got unpacked. I don't know where it is. But that's one of my favorite, more contemporary books. Um, I guess you can call it behavioral finance type of book. And her deal is figure out how to separate luck from skill. And your bad poker player, players are bragging on how much money they won. Your good poker players, even though they may have won a lot of money, or kind of focusing on what they did wrong and how next time they could do that better. Your, as someone said down at Charlie, Charlie Kirk's retreat, your good traders, or I should say your, your bad traders or your novices, when they go to the bar, they're bragging about their recent trades. It's the same thing as a poker analogy that Anthony Duke made. Your good traders and your experienced traders are talking about how they got beat up in the markets or how they could have done something much better. As I often preach, good traders are humble. Whenever I get a little cocky, I get my ass handed to me. And that's one of the things I can guarantee in this market. A, you'll get your ass handed to you, especially if you get a little cocky. So again, as I beat the dead horse, understand the importance of the process versus the outcome. And the market, again, as I say, can be a really bad teacher. It'll say, hey, take a lot of risk. Go out there and pick up nickels in front of a bulldozer. In other words, it's another metaphor. Eat like a bird, poop like an elephant. Take huge risk for small gains. And you know what? That'll work until it don't. You know, don't believe me? Try it. Just risk, risk 10 points on every, any stock you trade, every stock you trade from now on, and take profits when you're up one point. Well, I guarantee you, you're going to have a pretty good success rate. You might be 90% successful doing that. But what's going to happen when you get whacked? Well, now you're going to have to have nine trades in a row to make up for it. And then guess what? Even though you think you're only risking 10 points, you might end up risking much more than that someday when that black swan move hits. So you have to really learn to separate luck from skill. And I think it was Terrence O'Dean said, we tend to attribute positive outcomes to skill and negative outcomes to bad luck. So very hard to be honest, especially in that post-mortem process, separate that luck from skill. So again, there's our bad teacher yet again. So pick the best, leave the rest, plan your trade, and do a pre-mortem. Again, this is stuff that I've been focusing on a lot. I've talked a lot about the post-mortems. Well, now I think something that's even more important than the post-mortem before you even get to the trade or even think about a post-mortem, do a pre-mortem and pick that trade apart a little bit. And that's one of the fun things we've been doing in a Facebook group is we've been tossing out some stocks. And, and I've tossed out a few and you guys have corrected me or 
pointed out a few things and I, and I thank you for that. Like, uh, like, man, I'd like a little IPO. I'm kind of getting hot and excited about an IPO and kind of look past the fact that the volume is extremely low. And you guys are like, Dave, you really want to get into that Hotel California? Meaning that, as one of you guys said, you could check out, but you could never leave. <laughs> check in, but you could, yeah, whatever. In other words, you can get into stock and you can't get out. So little things like that get pointed out. So make sure you do that pre-mortem to where you really look at that trade to make sure you have the best of the best and think twice before putting that capital in the harm's way. And then, of course, all you have to do is trade your plan. And then, of course, do the post-mortem, rinse, and repeat. So there's your trade sandwich there. Pick the best, leave the rest. Plan it out. Do a pre-mortem. You could do what's called mind sculpting. I found that book yesterday. Ian Robinson, mind sculpting, which basically you could see ahead of time how the trade will play out. And since we don't know how exactly it'll play out, play it out in your head, good, bad, and indifferent. Play it out in your head going sideways for the next three weeks, figure it out how you're going to do it. And I think it was in Ian Robinson's book where he talked a lot about Olympic athletes who get injured and play Xbox for six weeks. Then they get back to training and they're pretty much back to square zero. They're back to the beginning or whatever. It takes them a long, long time to recover. Those athletes who mentally rehearse their sports like they're actually doing it for those six weeks, when they come back, they hit the ground running, I guess literally in some cases. So do this on the next trade and then the next 1,000 trades. All right, a couple of random thoughts. And some of these were leftover slides. I'm not sure where they came from, whether it was this original presentation or not. But today, I'm thinking about this. We're just really scratching the surface from a psychological perspective. We have a need to be right, which often conflicts with trading. If you were, again, longer term trend trading, your need to be right, you're going to be right very little. So psychologically, it's going to be tough. And again, that's why I take the hybrid approach. We have a need to take action. Trading done properly can often be quite boredom, boring. It's kind of a, like sailing, hours of boredom, interrupted by brief moments of sheer panic. I am trying to pull as much money out of the market as fast as I can, okay? <laughs> the market doesn't care that I have bills to pay, right? It's hard to wait and wait. And I'm also very type A. I can't sit still. I was shaking a foot like crazy last night <laughs> at the dinner table. And uh, my wife's like, slaps my leg, like knock it off. I, I always have to be moving. I always have to be doing something. As I've said before, it's a bit of a sickness with me. So that really goes against being a good trader and waiting because I always have to be doing something. And the way I got around that was, well, start an educational business and I just stay busy, really busy, super busy. We have a need for certainty. If everything in your life was uncertain, it, you would be, you'd probably go crazy in a day. But in the markets, there's very little certainty. Need to avoid pain. The only way to make money is to put capital in the harm's way. So the only way to make profit is through pain. And we have a propensity to avoid pain. In fact, a lot of these things are what makes us functioning adults and also keeps us alive. I think it was in yesterday's presentation. If you didn't have that primal part of your brain, the lower level brain, little, small, tiny emotional parts, such as the amygdala and parts of the limbic system, you would be dead in a day. But that little brain can control your big train when it comes to trading. And then we have a need for positive feedback. And a lot of times you're not gonna get 
positive feedback in the market. Now, all these things, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. Maybe you go off on a tangent, imagine that. But all these things can really wear you down unless, of course, you're willing to embrace them, unless you're willing to say, well, wow, this is totally natural. And as I've been preaching a lot lately, if you just keep studying the, the trading psychology and you just keep peeling that onion, and then it starts making more and more sense. It's like, why do I get so angry when the market doesn't agree with me? Well, I took a personality test and scored extremely low in agreeableness. Okay, well, now I understand that. I scored a 0% in modesty. I'm a big ham. I like to show off. Maybe if you are willing to pay the two drink minimum, I'll tell you some stories of some crazy things that I've done. <laughs> some of which I'm not proud of, but some of them I think are damn funny. But that means I have an ego and I like to, I feel like I have to extract that money every day from the market. So I have a lot of things that are working against me, but I'm willing to embrace that. And when I feel that need to be right, the need to take action, the need for certainty, the need to avoid pain, the need for the positive feedback, I recognize that all of these feelings are natural and that says, okay, okay, Dave, well, that's, that's what trading is. One last thought, one of my clients who i work with for years and he finally reached a point where he's doing really well, but he has had a lot of trials and tribulations. And a few years back when we were working together and he was struggling kind of bit, quite a bit, I should say, he told me, he goes, you know, this is really caught, not taught. And that kind of stuck with me. So that's why I preach so much. And then I have to keep preaching, even though a lot of you guys roll your eyes, is because you have to experience these things and go through these things yourself and reach a point where you you get it through living through them. So it's caught, not taught. Okay, a couple of things. I've been using a lot of examples lately. It's been some really interesting dead money reports. A lot of shorts have showed up lately and worked out nicely. So I would encourage you to review the archives if you're on the trading service, you look below the, and I think this is um, the URL, you can get to this from the members area. The member area would be here, the dashboard, if you click on that, that's the dashboard. But below the service, I keep the archives. And if you're not a member of the service, I would go in, or I would encourage you to go in, I should say, and look at the recent services just to see how we're playing the current market. And I think that's a great exercise. And it's kind of like, I used to call this the, the delayed service when I had a delayed service out there for free. I used to call that foresight in hindsight. So it's one thing for me to come in here and cherry pick a few stocks and go, hey, look at this, it worked out great. It's another thing to provide you with the archives to say, well, what was Dave seeing? Why did he see what he saw? And how did it shake out? Okay, not that I'm the grand poobah, but at least you could see what I'm seeing or was seeing and my thought process, good, bad, or indifferent. So go in and take a look at those archives and that's under the members area. Oh, there's a there's the URL right there. Oh, this is the URL for all of the archives. And again, I keep saying I'm gonna shorten that, but that has archives going back quite a ways. Now, the other thing I'd encourage you to do is join the members area for $47. I mean, come on, you got 47 bucks, right? <laughs> And if you don't have that, you shouldn't be trading. Well, I'm half kidding, but no, seriously, you don't have enough money to trade if you can't afford 47 bucks. And then I promise that'll make you worth your while. Now it is a subscription, but we have a good time in the Facebook group. And I think that that pays for itself in and of itself. And then there's a lot of good stuff in the members area. We do a bi-weekly Q and A. We have four members courses, and then you can unlock those premium courses over time. All right, I guess the question is, market broke out a couple days ago. S&P made new highs yesterday. Is winter still coming? That bastard John Snow's been talking about winter forever. You know, are we out of the woods? 
just yet. Let's get to the live charts and take a look at all that. If you guys want to start asking about individual stock picks, feel free to do so now. What Chief Orman really wound up today. All right, let's take a look at the overall market and let's flesh out a few things in here. I think, I guess we're always at an interesting juncture in the markets, but I think now is a really, really interesting juncture because there's some interesting things that are happening. Now, obviously we've been wide loose for a long term time. We broke out a few days ago. And one of the things that I've been saying quite a bit and if you don't, if you doubt me or whatever, go back, not that everything's played out like I said, but if you doubt me, go back a week or two and look at what I've been saying. And one of the things I've been saying, and I think you have to kind of play out a few different scenarios in your head. So when it happens, you're not totally surprised. But one of the things that I said was, it would not surprise me if this market broke out and then came right back in. And the reason I was thinking that is it goes to the old adage, again, that we talked about earlier from Linda or whoever, that a market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most. Well, I always ask myself, what would frustrate the most? What would the market have to do to frustrate the most? Well, it would have to break out to new highs, which would suggest an all clear, so to speak, and then come back in, suck people in, spit people out, okay? And that's one of my concerns, not that it's played out yet, but that was one of my scenarios to watch for. Now, not the end of the world, we're just off of all-time highs, but one of the things I was concerned about, and I think I talked about in the week of charts, I'm sorry, the market in a minute this morning, is that when you're right above a big fat wide and loose base, okay, like we are now, and you break out, but you're just sitting right above that day, so one or two big down days could put you back in the soup, so to speak. And this isn't that big of a down day. It's only, what, a half a percent? So that's a little concerning. Now, I hate to use the word hope, but I hope this market breaks out and keeps on going, even though I am more short than I'm long now, and my only longs are in gold, okay? So I'm Still kind of bearish in here, but I'm not stupid. I have stops, and if the market keeps going higher, I'm going to have to stop out, okay, and get long. I'm just not seeing a lot of good-looking long setups right now. That could be one of two things, and I'm not sure exactly which one it is or a combination thereof. One of the things it could be is that the methodology requires a pullback, and as long as the market's making new highs and not really pulling back, you're not going to see any setups. Number two, the database could be speaking. We've had a plethora of shorts lately, in spite of this market being around its prior new highs. So we're just going to have to continue to pay attention. NASDAQ composite, little strong start this morning, down a little bit today, not the end of the world there. Kind of triple toppy looking still, kind of head and shouldery looking still. But we're right at these all time highs. Let's just double check this real quick. From there to there. Let's see. Nope, that wasn't, an, I thought that was an all time high a few days ago. My apologies. I should have double checked that. So NASDAQ didn't technically make it to all-time highs just yet close enough for government work but kind of interesting so i wouldn't rush out and buy stocks just yet although as a general statement the market has been improving i'm not going to be obstinate yeah keep the questions and, and stock picks coming we'll uh, we'll get to those in just one second gold the commodity while we're up here uh you can see it pull back, consolidated. It looks like it's trying to rally again. I wouldn't rush out and buy gold, but it makes me feel a little bit better for owning a couple gold stocks. And if you look at a weekly chart, as I often preach, sometimes a weekly chart helps to put things in perspective and a little wide and loose, but more recent times, trending higher and pulling back a bit, okay? Let's get back to the Russell. 
or I should say, let's get back to the indices real quick. Russell 2000 selling off a little hard. My big concern here was that, okay, we had this nice rally, but very oversold. I'm sorry, very overbought. And then approaching the top of this wide and loose trading range. And as I've been saying quite a bit, for me to get excited about the Russell, we take a look at a weekly chart, a little bit more obvious. It's going to have to take out this retrace rally in here and ideally go on to make new highs. Let's look at a monthly chart. I haven't done a monthly chart in a while, just for SMGs. Yeah, kind of interesting, huh? Gives you a little perspective. Two things I'm seeing on the monthly chart. Number one, longer term, looks like it's still in an uptrend. But shorter term, now these are months, remember. Shorter term, we've got a thrust down, followed by a retrace. So far, I'm not calling a wave or anything, but so far, a thrust pullback kind of a thrust lower so kind of interesting i just thought it'd be fun to pull that up let's take a look at some sector action really quick and then we'll pop into the individual issues and answer some questions energy's getting hit kind of hard in here i was bullish on these guys a while back and then that kind of failed miserably let's take a look at metals and mining kind of all over the place improving as of late today notwithstanding gold stocks have pulled back in here recently and now they're trying to break out a little bit. Gonna be a lot of fits and starts there. That's just how it works. Silver stocks don't look quite as good as gold, but you can see they're kind of hanging in there, pulled back and this is kind of consolidating. I would not rush out and buy any new stocks here, especially in silver, but I think it's okay to continue to follow your plan. Not that you wanna constantly justify following your plan. Some of these areas like foods look like they could still be in trouble. If you put like bow ties in, you can see we have a bow tie down there. So it could still be in trouble. Some other areas like banks have improved as of late today, notwithstanding, okay? But that's the other thing too is, and I'm just seeing this with the banks, I haven't looked at them yet today, but you watch some of these areas that have been trending lately, a few big down days puts them back into the soup. And that's why I'm just not that excited about the market just yet. Let's take a look at drugs. Down a little bit in here, wide and loose. I'm doing really well as of late. One problem that I'm having, especially with these areas that have been dubious not that long ago, is that we've had these big, huge rallies. And so these markets are very oversold. Now, I'm not a big oscillator plotter, but I think it'd be kind of an interesting experiment to plot an oscillator on a, on a wide and loose market like this, just to see how oversold it, they are by that measurement. And then I think it'd be fun to see how many times does the market extend further from that. Now I'm not gonna show, show you, I don't want you to see how little I know about statistics, but I think if you had a lot of time, it'd be interesting to see how, how many times you could have a deviation above so many deviations and how often that occurs and it's probably a statistical measurement now be careful with statistics in the markets but i think it'd be interesting research something to do health services have improved quite a bit but that's another one of those areas where okay they looked pretty questionable just a little while ago they've come straight back up but now they're bumping up against their old highs and then not the end of the world but down one percent today beginning to look questionable again some areas like the fence have remained toppy for quite a while in here. The point I'm trying to make is it's it's still fairly mixed out there. Retail was kind of off to the races not that long ago, and despite this recent little breakout in the overall market, it's come back in, okay? Now, is the market trying to fool me? Maybe, I don't know, okay? But that's something that's in the back of my head. Transport's wide and loose, never did break out, came back in. I'd much rather pay attention to the semis and the transport. So let's see what they're saying. Not the end of the world there. Okay, they broke out, pulling back a little bit so far, looked pretty good, right? But one more big down day would put you back into this, this soup, okay? So even though the market's headed higher, as a general statement, there's still plenty to worry about. And it's not like it's firing on all eight cylinders. Bonds still look pretty dubious. 
today notwithstanding in here, thrust, pullback, deep retrace, I should say, thrust, and then I guess we have to put a question mark here. But so far, it still looks like it could be in trouble. Let's take a look at a weekly. I guess a weekly is still technically a pullback, but shorter term or intermediate term is still a questionable to me. And then finally, easy for me to say, let's take a look at the dollar. And I haven't looked at the bow ties, but if I had to guess, they would be a bow tie. And lo and behold, that's a bow tie, okay? Sometimes you get a first thrust, first thrust and a bow tie all come together, same deal. So the dollar looks like it could be in a little bit of trouble. Now, dollar down means what? Commodities up. So we could see those gold stocks, and maybe it's I'm just um, into wishing, but maybe those gold stocks will get a bit of a bid based on the action in the dollar. Okay. All right. Lots of questions and a few stock picks. All right. Chris says... Yeah, Chris had lost audio earlier. If you ever lose audio, just uh, maybe log back in, check your speakers. The go to webinar, I've been really happy with them. And I've used quite a few platforms because I do a lot of outside presentations and I've been really happy with them. And I'm gonna stick with them for a long time. I know a lot of people just change all the time, but I've been really happy with them and they're fairly robust. I've rarely had any true audio issues with them, but yeah, sometimes maybe a squirrel will get his nuts caught in the wire somewhere between me and you and cause some problems. All right, hi Dave, setups are still sparse on the long side. Yeah, good observation, Chris, good observation. Um, I've been having a hard time finding a long to save my life. A couple of refiners have trended nicely and are now pulling back, but overhead supply is a big issue. I'm not a huge fan of the refiners. I just, and, and I don't know, I need to think about why that is. I guess it's just a horrible business to be in. Um, for a refiner, you would want low oil prices, right? It's a little counterintuitive. Let's see if we can get to the Morningstar Industry Group's and let's take a look at the refiners. So yeah, you're right. The refiners are looking better in here, okay? But they can be a little wide and loose. They can be more wide and loose, I guess, than the energies. It's one reason why I'm not a huge fan of the refiners. All right, let's finish the sentence. A couple of refiners that trended nicely are now pulling back, but overhead supply is a big issue. In fact, we'll take a look at some of that. All right, let's go to the sub industry and we'll take a look at a few of these. In fact, overhead supply is a big factor in any potential setups I have come across recently. Um, yeah, you have to work hard to find stocks. I hear you in more recent times, especially if you're trading a transitional type of pattern where they're to avoid overhead supply. MPC is a good example and it fits nicely with today's show. Okay. Well, let's take a look at that. But good observations. I'm glad you're seeing what I'm seeing. Not that I'm always looking for confirmation. I'd probably do better if I'm always looking for somebody to prove me wrong. MPC. Just punch it out. Oops. Bad finger. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of, it's really wide and loose. Okay, first thing you do, draw a line to the left. Look at where your pullback is, draw a line to the left. So yeah, it has a lot of bad memories, so to speak. And it's also kind of wide and loose. Now with these commodity stocks, you have to be a little more lenient, but it's kind of interesting. With that aside, throw that out the window, the fact that it's wide and loose longer term, over the intermediate term, it actually looks pretty good and has a lot of things we talked about. Like, what did we talk about earlier? We talked about gaps in the direction of the trend. What did we talk about earlier? We talked about persistency. So that's a really good looking chart, Chris. But I would pass based on the fact that you have a lot of wide loose trading above the market, okay? Let's see if there's anything else in these refiners. 
you can see they're just kind of, except for that one. I mean, that one looks okay. Same sort of thing though. You've got a lot of overhead supply. This one's all over the place. This one, that's the overall sector. Uh, I mean, that's okay, but I don't know. Just having a hard time getting excited about these guys. Now that one looks, this one looks kind of interesting. But yeah, you do have a lot of bad memories, but if I had to pick one between this and the NBC, no, eh, it just doesn't have the, just hard to get excited about it. Not that much acceleration higher. All right, enough on that. USX, Phoenix, bow tie, too much too soon. Weekly MA is getting close. All right, let's take a look at that. USX. Um, these truckers can be a little wide and loose. I hear you. Does have some overhead supply. Well, one thing I don't like in here is that you had your transitional setup back here. You sold off, you came back up. And so now you're kind of, you're kind of in this wide and loose trading in here. I mean, it's not horrible. It looks like a bottom. I hear you, good eye. But I'm having a hard time getting excited about it. Let's take a look at the weekly chart. There's a bow tie. Let's take a look at weekly bow tie. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. It could it could bow tie up on a weekly basis. Weekly MA is getting close. I think it would pass. Just kind of a little. It's a little wide and loose, and it looks like it's just still in the process of trying to bottom. I think if we didn't have this trading here, the chart would look a little bit better. And lately, I've just been a really, really um, picky in my stock picking. And I think you should you should be too, not just because of current conditions, but just as a general statement. All right, any more questions? Any more stock picks? Oh, geez, we're out of time. I guess we don't have time for any more. All right, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate that very much. Anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLandry.com. Thank you so much.